So we ended episode six with Matt being left out of the ways and a whole lot of questions about what was going on. And as a book reader, questions about some of the changes to the story. Episode seven, many hoped, would answer some of these questions and set up the final climactic end to Wheel of Time season one. And possibly answer the question that has been posed all season, who is the Dragon Reborn? Now in episode seven, that question is answered. But was it satisfying? How does this episode stack up? Join me as I give my full review of episode seven of the Wheel of Time, The Dark Along the Ways. Quick thank you to the video sponsor, NordVPN. Nord is the number one VPN provider in the world, and I'm proud to have them as a sponsor on the channel. I've been using them long before they were a sponsor. What a VPN does is it acts as an intermediary between your computer and your internet service provider. It protects your browsing data from your ISP, tracking what you do online and then selling your data. It also allows you to get around geo-locked content. You could watch the European version of Netflix, for instance, if you lived in the US. Now, VPNs are always cheap, but because you're one of my viewers, they are even cheaper. Click the link in the description of the video and you will get a massive discount on what is already a fairly cheap cost from NordVPN, and it's something that you should have already. Check that out. Let's hit the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through episodes one through seven of the Wheel of Time season one. I'll avoid any book spoilers here. So as long as you've seen the show, you will be good to watch this video. So this episode introduced a couple new locations and some new characters to the story that I think many book fans have been waiting on for a while. But was it good? I'm going to run you through what I loved about this episode, what I didn't love. And I'm going to give you my general thoughts before finally giving this episode a score out of 10. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. This cold open was one of the best of the season, and I literally loved like every second of it. Fans of the books know exactly what scene this was from the moment we saw the snow, and I think everyone else was just blown away by the choreography. This was so well done, and I have to say that a pregnant Aiel Maiden of the Spear taking down soldier after soldier while in labor is pretty badass. I cannot wait to get more Aiel. Now the show is still showing and not telling, so I'm not sure that the backstory is super clear here yet, but they are giving it out one piece at a time, and I love that. It leaves tons to speculate on, and I think it's been a lot of fun watching non-readers speculate on what's going to happen. I thought they also did a, as good of a job as they could with making Matt's disappearance seem like that was supposed to happen. This was never gonna feel seamless, and I think using it as part of the tension for the episode worked as well well as could be expected. And it does leave me wondering what they're going to do next with this character. I wasn't overly let down by the fact that Matt wasn't there because again, we talked about this in the last episode, they had to do it. And I thought they did as well of a job as they could given the circumstance. Now, in terms of the ways I liked some things and I didn't like others, we'll talk about what I didn't like here in a minute, but I'll say that I thought the ways captured the infinite blackness and darkness really well. It felt like their torches barely lit the areas around them. And I like that. That's basically straight out of the books. The vibe to the place was certainly really, really creepy. Having the black wind play on their doubts and attempt to drive them crazy was, I thought, very actually fitting considering the origin of the Black Wind from the books, even though that wasn't covered here in the episode. I think it does actually make sense given the backstory in the books, which we won't talk about right now. Now, I loved Faldara. I thought the fortress looked amazing. I actually like that it sits right in front of Tarwin's Gap. That's a small change from the books. It's a beautiful set. Even the interiors of the fortress looked amazing. They really knocked it out of the park on the set design for this one. We are also introduced to a few characters in this episode, specifically Uno, Agomar, Lady Amalisa, and of course, Min Farshaw. Now, it was really fun seeing all of them, but I specifically liked Kai Alexander as Min. She's slightly more mature in the books, probably a little bit more cynical, at least in her initial portrayal, and I was okay with that. Min came across as a character who will have quite a bit of agency in the show, like she has her own opinion, she's pretty strong-willed. That's something she doesn't always have in the books, so I was actually pretty cool with the way she was shown on camera. In terms of her visions, this was one of the things I was very curious to see how they would handle on the show. While I did not think that it was perfect, I did like that it just wasn't like a thought bubble with something playing like a vision above their heads. The way they did it did not look cheesy, so I did like that. I think there was a chance that it could have drifted into like cheesy territory with her visions. I thought it did well. It wasn't perfect though. I just like the introduction of men in general though, as I think it adds more foreshadowing into the show. Her visions always come true, so it's it's fun to hear what she says and then speculate about when and where it's going to happen. For instance, she says the Amarlin will be the downfall of Moraine. 
which hits Moraine pretty hard. Now, does that mean that Swan sending him to the eye will partially be her downfall or something else? I just enjoy that speculation. I think they're doing it on purpose. And I think Min, in general, in the book series even, adds that to a lot of scenes. I think it's one of the things that Wheel of Time fans have been speculating on for years. I also love that we got more of an introduction to Lan's backstory. We got to hear about Malkir and how he was raised in Faldara. I enjoyed that backstory. I certainly think it gives a little bit more world building to the show by advancing one of the characters as well. Hopefully they'll dive a little bit more into Malkir because I want to really get into that and understand it because it's such a cool story. Hopefully we'll get into that maybe even in the next episode. Speaking of Lan, I actually enjoyed them moving the relationship between Lan and Nynaeve forward a bit. Yes, the idea that they slept together might bother some people. It didn't bother me really at all. I think that it felt right considering that these aren't the same bumbling kids that they are in the books and they are aged appropriately and I think this is what people at that age would do. This wasn't like it came out of the blue they met each other and, and hopped in the sack. Uh, this is sort of tension has been building now for a little while. And keep in mind they were together for basically a month so there's even more going on there. So the fact that they've slept together after crushing on each other for a little bit more than a month, it makes sense. There's clearly an attraction there. So I just thought it felt right. It is a little bit different from Lan's character. I think Lan is showing a little bit more emotion in the show, but not to the point that I think he loses his stoic appearance. So I've been fine for the most part with Lan's changes. I loved Rand's progression in this episode. While I still don't think he's super likable, he isn't really likable in the books either. Rand was finally featured in an episode this week. The flashbacks to Winter Night were great. I'm glad we got to see some of Tam's fever dreams and the reveal that Tam was the one to find the Aiel and Rand on Dragon Mount. I also really loved the scene showing where Rand had channeled throughout the series so far. I thought it was a really cool reveal and the symbolism of him missing the target while he's doing archery, while he's struggling with realizing that it's him, and then finally hitting the bullseyes once he's let it sink in that it is him. I thought that was really cool. So the reveal of Rand being the Dragon Reborn I thought was awesome. Now his conversation with Min was also super cool to see. Her comments to him have me very excited to see what's going to happen in episode 8 because there's sort of an implication that he won't be coming back. So that'll be interesting to see. The last thing, and I saved it for last this time because I usually lead with it, was that the performances were outstanding again. I thought Yosha was great this week as he was finally given a chance to do more. Really, the star in my opinion, back to that cold open, I really thought the actress that played the Aiel was outstanding. It was so believable, and I'm glad they chose to keep her veil down. Normally, Aiel are only going to attack with their veils up. She had it up at the beginning, pulls it down as she was going into labor, and then was defending herself basically from that point on. And I know some will say, well, she would have pulled it back up. I'm going to give her a break. She was going into labor. But more importantly, without that veil down, we would not have got to see that amazing performance, the, the visuals of her face. She never even says a line in that, and I thought she stole the show. But let's move on to some of the things that I did not like. And I guess we'll start with Loyal. I feel like he has been completely underused so far. I mean, at this point, I would have just cut his character entirely if this is all we were going to get of him. I think there was a squandered chance to have him give the backstory of the ways, which is something that I pointed out in the last episode I was hoping we would get, and we still did not get it. Like... What is the Black Wind? Why are the ways how they are? Who built them? What are they built for? All of these things could have been answered had they just had a scene while they're walking along where Loyal gives that information. They started doing it by talking about the trees and things that used to be on the islands, which again, that's cool. It's right out of the books. But they stopped and didn't give what I think was the vital information that would have given the backstory, would have expanded the world building, all of that. It would have also given Loyal's character something to do. I mean, at this point, I'm not really sure why he was even there. He read one guiding, but he doesn't seem to have a connection to the ways otherwise. We just spent way too little time in the ways, and the escape was too convenient, and it was too quick. These scenes would have been improved with some basic exposition to the group about the ways from Loyal, in my opinion. I think it would have solved a lot of the issues that I had with the episode. Now, this is also tied in with the explanations about how Pot on Fane could be following them and how he left the ways without being able to channel. Now there is an explanation, and they seemingly gave it in some of the behind the scenes pictures that were posted with the episode, with Fane holding what appears to be a trefoil leaf in his hand outside the Faldara Wege. But why not just put that in the show? Give some more explanation, or at least put that picture 
You don't even have to explain what it is, but show him holding it so we know there's something else that can be done. But all of this sits at the core of one of the problems with the season in general, in my opinion. The showrunners have done well with the time allotments they've been given, but eight episodes was criminal to be given to this series, in my opinion. Amazon. You hurt your show by requiring too much to be cut for time. Most of my criticisms from this season have stemmed from that. Going all the way back to the first episode and the abrupt departure and the poor pacing. They have been forced to cut things that really hurt the story and wouldn't be huge additions. It's not like I'm talking about adding 10 more episodes. Do a 10 episode season, space it out a little bit more, and I think it works. I think in a series with world building as its strength, like Wheel of Time, making a show cut a ton of it out is problematic. But I want to talk about another major thing that I didn't like in this episode, mainly because it just felt stupid to me and pointless. And that was the drama between Perrin and Rand over Egwene. It felt very CW, for lack of a better way of putting it. It was acted well. It wasn't like there was a problem with that. And there isn't even a real love triangle going on. It's just a crush from Perrin on Egwene that she's not returning. But I think it cheapens the Layla fridging even more. And it really feels like just a poor character choice for Perrin. I don't really think that expands his character at all. So why is it there? And before anybody flips out, by the way, and says that this was just totally made up for the show and they're going CW on us, that's not entirely true. This was sort of hinted at in Eye of the World. I mean, Perrin gets very jealous of Egwene dancing with Aram. We get hints there. We just never get more than hints. And this is an instance where adapting the book was problematic to me. I think it would have been better just to leave all of that out because I don't think it adds anything to the story. Fortunately, they didn't dwell on the moment. It just felt unnecessary especially considering that I went on a rant about how much they cut small scenes out that would have helped move the plot and the world building forward, and instead we inserted pointless drama out of nowhere that goes nowhere for a main character. In general, though, I really liked this episode, and I would put it as my favorite of the season so far, despite some of the things that I just said I don't like. There was lots of good foreshadowing, which I'm a sucker for in general, a lot of unanswered questions, for instance, why would Moraine have the Red Aja looking for Matt? That seems very odd to me and out of character, but nevertheless, I want to know because it was that was done to mislead us and deliberately in my opinion. This episode clearly has a set up for the final episode and I very much cannot wait to see how they end the season. If they can top this episode and go out on a high note, I think that the season will have been a pretty big success. If this season is a dud, I think it is going to hurt the series a little bit. The Eye of the World scene from the books is one of the most confusing and polarizing portions of the books in general, so I think they're going to have wide latitude from book fans at least to fix some of the plot holes and confusing storyline there, and I hope they do it well. So as for a score, I'm going to give The Dark Along the Ways an 8.5 out of 10. I can't quite get myself to give it a 9 or higher, as I just wasn't floored by how good it was. It was outstanding in parts, and I'm certainly sucked into the story, but I just haven't been stunned with how good it was yet. So I'm really hoping we get there the next episode where I can be like, boom, that floored me. But what did you all think of the episode? What would your score be? Let me know in the comments of the video. Also, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I get more Wheel of Time content out. Make sure to click the bell icon so you can be updated exactly when those videos post. There's a lot more coming over the holidays and you do not want to miss anything. Thank you again to NordVPN. Make sure to check them out. Huge, huge thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for supporting the channel and the work here. Literally could not do this without you. Check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thank you everybody for watching and until next time, peace out.